From the News Channel 5 Network, this is On The Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. I am Ben Hall. Very good show tonight. We are talking about guns, guns and gun laws in Tennessee. The legislative session is coming up. Where are some of the big bills, some of the laws that um, will be discussed in this upcoming legislative session? It's always interesting. I want to hear from you. What do you think? And always happy to have with us John Harris, president of the Tennessee Firearms Association. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for inviting me. So it's a uh, you know, good conversation. Always interesting to hear your perspective <laughs> on these things. This session, kind of what's, what's on the table? The two biggest topics, at least from our perspective, bills we want to advance in the 2016 legislative cycle are going to be constitutional carry, which is increasingly the law of other states, and the elimination of gun-free zones, and the, and the shootings down in Chattanooga has really driven that uh, exponentially over the summer, talking to legislators. And we'll drill down into what those are, and we've talked about what um, constitutional carry is. It means. No, um, no permit required. No permit required, and people certainly have an opinion about that. But this session, okay. So, what do you think um, the chances are of you getting those things of that of both of those passing? Well, as a, as a practical matter, I've I've been doing this for 20 years, you know, outside of my law practice. So, I've got two decades of experience, and what we know is in these even numbered years like 2016, the legislators can't campaign or raise money when they're in session. So they want to get in and get out as fast as they can because they want to get reelected. That's the number one driving motivation for most elected officials is getting reelected. Everything else is secondary. So does that? How does that impact? I mean, if these are popular, it seems like they just pass them. Well, it could, it could, but by the same token, you could hear leadership saying, "Let's not pass anything that's controversial. Let's not give our." adversaries, whether it's in the primary or the general election, ammunition to use against us. So I think over the last two decades what I've seen is these even numbered years, unless there's something really unusual going on, they tend to keep the controversy in terms of what they're talking about. Like I don't think you'll see the gas tax packs because it's an election year. Uh, those kinds of things are far less likely to be top tier agenda items. Uh, there is one uh, lawmaker, at least one, who's talking about following the shooting out in Oregon to allow guns on college campuses. Right. What do you think about that? I think we should. You know, we, we, we take young men and women at 18 and, and potentially younger and send them off to the military. Uh, we have a lot of people on college campuses. I mean, one of my law professors, Larry Soderquist at Vanderbilt, advocated for that for years all the way back into this, you know, the 90s. And college campuses, uh, it is a place where I think it's reasonably safe to introduce the idea that uh, citizens should be allowed to defend themselves. It's just a completely different environment than other schools. So the Tennessee Board of Regents disagrees. So they do, but you know. And they say providing our students, faculty, and staff with a safe, healthy environment is a vital component to meeting um, our goals. For that reason, Tennessee Board of Regents has historically opposed and will continue to oppose any bill that would distract us from that focus, particularly one that could they would do this. Right. They want an unarmed herd of sheep that they can just lecture, you know, and indoctrinate, as opposed to competent citizens prepared and able to defend themselves should an aggression occur. And see, I think that is kind of the, the that's, that's kind of the central kind of issue in this whole debate. Here you have the Tennessee Board of Regents saying safety is our number one priority. As a result, we don't want to open the door to guns. Right. And your argument, I believe, is that safety is important and therefore you should allow guns. Right. It's this disconnect. Well, but the data proves generally, if you if you study the the, the sociology of it and, and the crime data, that arming an adult population is far safer than having an unarmed population that's exposed to criminal aggression. So in all the states that have passed uh, or enabled legislation that allows citizens to carry violent crime as a general rule. Now, you're still going to have domestics. You're still going to have r murder related to domestics. But as a general rule, violent crime, the criminal, the thief, the drug addict against the average citizen victim goes down in, in situations where uh, civilians can carry arms. And the concern for some would be that a situation that might result in two people pushing each other if they get frustrated instead results in a gunfight. Yeah, but the, that was the concern when we told 
you know, people back in the in the mid 90s that you could have your guns in your cars. And I mean, Senator Jackson back then, when he was opposing it, was all about road rage. You know, we were going to have shootings, but we, we've had it for 20 years and there haven't been shootings. Uh, I hate to age myself too much, but you know, I was a I, I did seven years at Vanderbilt. I was an undergraduate and then law school. And when I went into Vanderbilt. Uh, one of the perks you had as a student was to use the recreational facilities, you know, the gym, the tracks, the gun range. They had a gun range indoor under the engineering buildings. I could walk across campus with my gun and ammo, and it was perfectly okay, but we didn't have a lot of shootings, you know, in the 70s and 80s on Vanderbilt campus, and there was a gun range there. And I don't think we're going to have them now. I think it'd be safer. You let those uh, young students, particularly the women students, who are on campus going back and forth, particularly with, you know, getting dark at 4.30, between classes able to defend themselves. You know, right now they got two options. And, and one is be a victim, and the other is walk across campus with a friend who runs slower than you do. And that's about it. <laughs> Does it concern you, and how, how do we deal with this? So we have, there's no doubt we've seen more shootings. Right. We've seen more mass shootings. And they are just heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, and they infuriate people. Right. And people want to do something. And what what can we realistically do? Is is there anything we can realistically do to to lower that amount? Or is this just an era where we're just going to see them? It's just, this is just our new reality. Well, and a part of it may well be our new reality because of the way we don't aggressively deal with the issue of mental illness. The the new factor that's coming into the multi-victim shooting scenario is you know, historically in this country, multi-victim shootings have been based upon almost always uh, people with mental illness issues, okay? The new element that's going to come into it now and complicate it even more is what happened in Chattanooga where it wasn't necessarily mental illness, it was terrorism, if that in fact was terrorism. So we now we have these two layered on top of each other and, and the one thing that being an adult ready and able to defend yourself does is it doesn't necessarily eliminate the possibility or the probability that there's going to be an attack. What it has the ability to do is to materially reduce the number of victims in the attack. And so you've said mental illness before, and I may have asked this before, but the very powerful gun lobby that is advancing, you know, we need more access to guns in a world where there's already a lot. Mm -hmm. Could they also make part of their agenda, this very politically powerful group, the mental illness component? Because that has been neglected, there's no doubt. Oh, we, yeah. We've shut, we, we have fewer mental illness beds, we have, you know, there are fewer uh, resources available in many cases to the mentally ill. And I think that's, there's no doubt that many of these shootings are the result of a, a mentally ill person. Right. So do you, do you see that corner being turned that the gun lobby, this powerful entity in our, pol our, our, in our politics, will take that issue on? Oh, I think that the gun lobby would be supportive of realistic, practical means of getting help for people with mental illness. Uh, you know, there, there are certain people in, in our society that are a danger to themselves and to others. And if they fit that definition, then their access to tools of harm needs to be restricted. The problem that you're going to see, particularly at the state level, with any type of expansive effort to deal with or address mental illness is the fiscal note. The government doesn't want to spend the money it's going to take. That's why years ago they used to have mental health facilities to deal with mental illness, and, and they quit because they didn't want to spend the money on it. Now they closed them. Yeah, they just shut them down. Um, all right, we have... We have several calls. I'm going to start taking calls here. Let's go to <laughs> Lee. Hello, Lee. Yes. Hi. What's on your mind? Uh, this guy is a nutcase. Uh, to, to allow college kids to have guns, college kids do a lot of drinking. They have no impulse control. They have hormones raging. And to think that, you know, you should have college kids running around with guns is absolutely stupid. And we don't, we, the, the last, we need gun regulation to make absolutely certain that people are schizophrenic, going to be depressed, they will have a history of domestic violence, or violence against others, are not allowed to have a gun. All right, well, let's, um, it's a you know emotional issue, passionate. What 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 do you what do you think about that? Well, uh, you know he, he can have whatever emotional response he wants, but what I try to look at is is we have 50 states and we have I know at least one now where by state law students are allowed to carry, and in that state 
uh, I want to say it's Oklahoma, but I'm not, I, I'd have to check that. I know we've got at least one. We don't have college students killing each other at any higher rate in that state because they can carry guns on campus than in any other state. Now, th they may drink, they may do drugs, they may use poor judgment, but th that doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to pick up the gun and just start shooting everybody, you know, at the toga party. Uh, so it doesn't concern you. His point was, yeah, they drank low impulse control or, or something, he said, along those lines. I guess sending your child, would you feel more comfortable sending your child, I guess, to a, a campus that allows guns? Is that an accurate statement? I would feel more comfortable if the, if, the, if the teachers, the faculty, the staff, and the students, because we're talking college, and, and a lot of them are, you know, they're 20s, 30s, 40s, because they come back from master's degrees, if they had the right to choose whether or not they wanted to carry to defend themselves, as opposed to be told as a blanket prohibition that nobody, once they walk onto this campus grounds, can be armed other than our campus security. Okay, we have to take a break. Uh, Mike, Will, and others, hold on the line. Uh, we'll get to your call. If you want to call, there's the number. 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. Take a break. We'll be back right after this.